Thanks for the introduction. My name is Gabby Fisher, and I'm a systems engineer at Cloudflare. Today, I'm really excited to talk about Go's support of WebAssembly and how WebAssembly will let us run Go in browsers and other cool environments. I'll first start out my talk by discussing where we commonly run Go, as well as places where we haven't really thought about using Go. I'll then introduce WebAssembly and what exactly it is. I'll go over the Go WASM tooling that's now provided as part of the Go language. I'll have some demos of cool WebAssembly and Go applications. And then I'll conclude by discussing the path forward for Go and WebAssembly. So when I think of gophers, I always subconsciously think of whales. And that's because Go and Docker, in my mind, go together very closely. Um, when I deploy code that's written in Go, it's often in a Docker container. And indeed, the Go development cycle that a lot of us are familiar with involves building your Go code into an executable, having that executable around so you can put it into a Docker container as a service, and then running that Docker container on an orchestration framework like Kubernetes. The underlying assumption here is that Go is something that we naturally just run on servers. And Go is a really popular backend language. We often use it to write backend services, APIs, and other backend tooling. This does beg the question, though, why haven't we tried running Go elsewhere? Is it because we can't put Go in other places? Where can't Go actually go? One place where Go is not easily deployed is the browser environment and other JavaScript environments in general. Browsers have been the land of JavaScript for over a decade now. And the problem with JavaScript for a backend engineer like me is that it tends to be quite distinct from the languages I'm really familiar with. Event-based programming is not the easiest thing to map on top of concurrency-based programming. As a systems engineer who recently had to write JavaScript for a project, I found learning JavaScript to have quite a learning curve. And many of its concepts, like promises, were very unfamiliar to me. It was honestly kind of telling when I learned that one of the backronyms for NPM is nothing prevents misery. Um, that was honestly my mood as I taught myself JavaScript and got through that learning curve. And I just found myself thinking, what would, have my, what would have my experience have been like if I had run Go in the browser instead of having to use a language I'm really unfamiliar with? There is some tooling that lets you run Go in what is a JavaScript environment. Um, that includes the transpiler Go for JS. The thing is that when you're transpiling Go to JavaScript, you lose some of the performance benefits and other, um, other runtime goodies that you get from Go usually. So I was thinking, what if there were a way to actually run compiled Go code in JavaScript instead of having to turn it into JavaScript before executing it? This is where WebAssembly comes in. WebAssembly is a binary instruction format that is meant to run on browsers, agnostic of whatever architecture or operating system the browser is on top of. As a systems nerd, I'm also really excited about WebAssembly because I think it's a really big stride. It's the first um, binary instruction format to be introduced and actually used in production in the last 30 years. And WebAssembly was designed to take away some of the lock-in that x86 and ARM introduced when running code, since you had to compile for individual targets that oftentimes couldn't go across different operating systems. WebAssembly can be run in all major browsers at the moment. So this includes Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Microsoft Edge. This means that theoretically any language that can compile into WebAssembly can be run on any of these popular browsers. So if Go has support for WebAssembly, that could be the answer to my question. I could run Go on the browser. And it is actually the case that with Go 1.11, um, there is actual support for running Go as WebAssembly. Oh. Um, so now we can actually let the, the gopher out of the box or the container and run it in environments that we previously hadn't um, entertained, like the browser. The tooling introduced with Go 1.11 includes a new syscall JS library that helps us write Go code that is meant to interface with JavaScript environments. It also includes a compiler target so we can compile our Go into WebAssembly. 
And finally, it includes some wrapper functionality that um, we can access as a JavaScript file to help glue our Go compiled in the WASM and our JavaScript environment together. So we can run Go in that JavaScript environment. Before I get into examples of these new features, I just want to provide a disclaimer that Go WASM support is still considered experimental, meaning that you can expect to see a lot of changes to Go WASM in upcoming Go releases. And some of these changes could also be breaking changes that make the examples I'm going to share today possibly uh, broken in the future. So let's get started with the syscall package. Um, Syscall.js allows us to call JavaScript from Go, but it also allows us to expose Go functions to JavaScript. I'll first cover an example where we're using Syscall.js to access um, JavaScript and perform JavaScript functionality in Go code. So in this case, I can actually get JavaScript variables from the document object model that we often see on web pages. I am getting the DOM, and I can also call elements on the DOM class, including get, or I can call functions on the DOM class, including get elements by ID. And what get elements by ID does is it takes the ID I pass in as the argument, and it returns to me the actual element and go. So what I have in this hello text variable is now the element in JavaScript for hello text. I can then call set functions on this element include, and um, then change fields in that element to a particular value. So I can access the inner HTML field of the hello text element and change it to say Go was here, because Go was indeed on this web page. To take a cue uh, from Missy Elliott, we're now going to flip it and reverse it. And we're going to expose Go to JavaScript and see what that type of deployment looks like. To call Go from JavaScript, we first need to define a function we'd like to expose. In this case, I'll work on a simple add function that takes a list of JavaScript numbers, sums them, and returns the sum to JavaScript. An important step is making sure that the function I seek to expose has this function signature. This is required. This function signature makes sure that we can access fields from a JavaScript class if this function becomes part of a JavaScript class. So those fields would be passed in through the this uh, parameter. Next, we have to make sure we can also pass in arguments to this function we expose. So I take JavaScript values in a list as my arguments. And finally, the return type for this function has to be an empty interface, meaning we can return anything. I honestly would prefer if um, it required us to return a JS value, so we have that symmetry between taking JavaScript arguments and taking uh, and returning a JavaScript value. Um, but there's a wrapper function I'll talk about later that automatically turns the uh, output into a JavaScript value. So now that we have an array of JavaScript numbers passed in, we're going to iterate through that array, and we need to convert all of those. Um, elements in the array, which are JavaScript numbers, into Go integers. So we can actually apply Go methods to it. So that's why I'm calling int here. And once I've iterated through all of the numbers in this JavaScript array, turn them in the ints, and sum them, I return that sum. Um, but I make sure to call value of beforehand to ensure that the sum I'm returning to JavaScript is in a JavaScript type, and it's not left in a Go type. Now, to expose this function that we've written, there are a couple more steps. The first of which is that we take this Go function and we have to turn it into a JavaScript function type. That's why we call JS func of on our add function. Um, func of is the wrapper function I mentioned earlier that converts your return type from add into a JavaScript type for you. So that's implicitly done, but I prefer to do it explicitly for the sake of clarity. Now that we have a variable add func that represents the JavaScript function um, that we've turned add into, we use a setter, like in the previous example, to set the add variable in our JavaScript environment to equal the add function that we turned into a JavaScript function. We also should free memory used for Go functions and variables on the heap. And 
You're probably wondering why I have this channel set up. This channel is an empty channel that is read from but never written to, and that serves to keep this main function alive. If we want to expose a function from Go to JavaScript, the Go binary must keep on running. Specifically, this main function must keep on running. Because if this main function exits, you might find yourself in a situation where your JavaScript code tries to call add and finds that add is undefined because it's no longer been set to equal add func as it was in Go. So we have to keep this um, main function alive. There are a couple of ways to do this that aren't as exotic as using channels. This is just what I see in a lot of Go Wasm in the wild. Um, you can use a wait group if you want. And Filippo mentioned you can even use an empty select to keep this main function alive. Now that we've done all of this work to set up our add function on the Go side, calling it from JavaScript is actually pretty easy. We can access it and use it like a function we wrote in pure JavaScript. There is a little more setup we need to do before we can actually run this, a program like this, however, and that involves the Wasm exec file, and I'll get to that very soon. Now that we've written Go code that is built to interface with JavaScript, we actually need to compile it into WebAssembly. And this is where the new WebAssembly target comes in. Invoking it is really similar to compiling Go for any specific operating system and architecture. In this case, you're just passing in JS as your operating system and Wasm as your architecture. And with that, you get your Wasm binary. Now that we have our Wasm binary, we just need to make sure we glue our Wasm and our calling JavaScript code together correctly. And this is where Wasm exec is useful. Wasm exec is a file you find in the actual Go language. It's under misc wasm. And its core purpose is to expose a Go class in JavaScript that you need to initialize in your JavaScript code. You only need to import this file and, export, and use the Go class from it to set up um, all of the necessary um, glue code between JavaScript and Go. But I'm going to look at this Go class with a little more detail just so you know what's really going on under the hood. This Go class um, has three tasks. Its first is to actually let you specify your configurations for the runtime you'd be starting in your Go Wasm code. This lets you pass in runtime variables like Go debug. It also does um, things like graceful error handling when your Go Wasm binary exits. So in this case, it's taking an exit code. And if it's non-zero, it'll actually properly log it to your console for you so that can assist with your debugging. Next, um, the Go class also provides a field called import object. And import object is very important because it provides JavaScript side functionality for interacting with JavaScript variables and correctly passing them into Go, and vice versa. This function here called JS value set is actually invoked by the syscall JS set function I demonstrated earlier. Had this function not been included in the import object, some of our syscall.js functions in our Wasm binary simply wouldn't work. Another example of glue code between um, JavaScript and Go that's handled by import object or specified an import object is logic for making sure that when you call log printf in Go, that's actually treated as a console log statement in JavaScript. So if you want to see output, or log output from your Go binary, um, it can actually be funneled into console log and treated as if it were part of your JavaScript. That's all handled in this field. And finally, this class also exposes a run function. And this run function takes your WebAssembly instance and actually starts it. It handles setting up global memory references between your JavaScript and your Go code. And it also maintains state, like whether your Wasm binary has exited or not. To revisit our add function, now that we know a little more about how to use Wasm exec, um, let's go over how we actually use the Go class to expose the add function we wrote earlier. First, we have to instantiate this Go class, and then we need to call a um, worker application or a worker function called WebAssembly dot instantiate streaming to load our Wasm binary as well as pass in our import object glue functions. Once we call that, we get our loaded WebAssembly instance. 
and then we call go run on it. Once the setup is complete, then we can call our add function and compute our sum, as if it were part of native JavaScript. With that, I'll give a quick demo of a fun application I built with Go and Wasm. Um, this demo is one that has us take a JavaScript byte array that represents an image, turn it into grayscale in Go, and then return the grayscale image as a JavaScript byte array so it can be displayed on a web page. In this case, I'm taking advantage of the optimized image library and the Go standard library to apply this transformation. So on the left side here, we have our image, or our function that takes um, our JavaScript input, which in this case is a JavaScript byte array, and then converts it into a Go byte array, or a byte slice in this case, and passes it into a helper function that applies the image transformation. Then we take the transformed image bytes, which are a Go slice, and we take that byte slice and turn it into a JavaScript byte array once again using the JS typed array of function. Once we've converted those transformed image bytes into uh, its proper Go type, we return it. On the right hand side, I expose this gray image function with the exact same logic I used to expose the add function earlier. So there's an image. Oh, wow, this plays here, but not on my laptop. Fascinating. Um, so you can see that I'm running this on a simple local server. Um, the WASM has been initialized, and I provide a simple HTML page that lets you upload a file, apply transformation to it. So we have a nice grayscaled calico cat. And we can continue invoking this exposed Go function to other images as well. So now we have this gray cat that's staring into your soul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so something you might have observed here is that that code was executed really fast. Uh, browsers are built to load third-party code as quickly and efficiently as, or as quickly as possible and run it as efficiently as possible um, because people want a seamless browser experience. When they download content from the internet that is dynamic, they want it to run in front of their eyes with no pause. This is partially because browsers use an architecture that doesn't rely on containers. Um, instead, they have a whole separate set of engines that are used to run this third-party code in a fashion that's like Go routines versus um, processes. It's a lightweight way to run um, untrusted third-party code, whereas containers are kind of like processes in this case. They provide a lot of isolation and sandboxing, but there's a cold start that takes a lot of time um, before you can actually see your code in action. This then brings up the question, this sounds like something that would be really useful in servers, especially if we want people to be able to run third-party code quickly. Um, and in a world where functions as a service are becoming extremely popular, it sounds like this is a cool way to leverage Wasm to build a whole new class of function as a service products. This is where I get to the beyond the browser part I promised in my talk title. Fast WASM loading and execution is why companies like Cloudflare and Fastly are thinking of using WebAssembly execution um, as the future of functions as a service, and especially to compete with pre-existing offerings like AWS Lambda functions, GCP functions, and Azure functions, which all rely on containers to run third-party code. Cloudflare Workers and Fastly Lucid are two examples of projects building this WASM on the server ecosystem. This is a really simplified chart that compares the stack necessary to run third-party code in a container function as a service versus running third-party code in a WASM-based function as a service implementation. Um, because container starts can take up to 500 milliseconds, being able to remove that layer from uh, function as a service offering like Cloudflare Workers enables us to get rid of up to half of a second of latency when running third party code. Um, that being said, there's still some 
performance benefits we can continue to squeeze out of using Wasm. And one of them is the fact that Wasm at the moment bundles an entire language runtime into each executable. And starting that runtime takes time that could be um, factored out if we had a shared runtime between different Go Wasm executables. This is uh, one of the core questions that is facing Wasm as we continue to develop it. And my colleague Ashley Williams has some really interesting thoughts on this. Um, one approach to this is taking that runtime out, keeping it uh, running and accessible to all of the third party applications we're loading on uh, a Wasm environment, and then making sure that we can just have a bunch of different Wasm applications share that runtime instead of starting it up individually. I'll provide a, click, a quick demo of using the same Grayscale code on a Cloudflare worker so I can create an endpoint that lets us apply Grayscale transformations to whatever image we like. So here I'm actually uploading my uh, worker script. And I've ex exposed it on my domain. I have gabby.fish, which I'm really proud of. <laughs> and I call the Grayscale endpoint. I pass in an image domain and path as, um, an arg as a parameter. This image domain and path is always requested over HTTPS because I hope that's how we're all requesting things these days. And I get a grayscale version of this kitten. And it, it was pretty snappy. Um, so it is, a, oh, there's another cute kitten there. <laughs> so I think that's an example of where Using Wasm as the basis for functions as a service is opening up a whole new world for running third party functions on the internet. You're free to try out that endpoint for yourself if you'd like. It's still live. I'll just warn you that one of my coworkers messaged me saying, like, you're the third largest user of workers' CPU time at the moment. Like, what are you doing? Um, if, you, if you use my endpoint, you can make me number one. And that would be really interesting for him to see. <laughs> Um, I, so I pr like to use Go Wasm for using Go functionality that is otherwise inaccessible in a JavaScript environment. Um, I also like Go Wasm because it lets us take advantage of these new functions as a service offerings we're seeing more of on the internet. And there are other reasons to use Go Wasm. A recent situation where I found myself very thankful for Go Wasm was when I had to deploy a entire Go package on a worker. And it's kind of hard to imagine rewriting this entire set of logic in JavaScript, because A, this is a lot of files, but B, these files used a lot of Go constructs like, um, like sync maps. And that's something that's really hard to translate to JavaScript event-based programming. So I was able to just compile this into a Go Wasm worker and uh, deploy that instead of thinking about rewriting code. And another thing that's nice about maintaining this consistency, maintaining a Go code base, is that we can envision a future where client-side and server-side code are both Go. And we can share all of the structures and functions we'd like between our client and our server instead of having to write the client in JavaScript. Since Go Wasm is still in development, there are a lot of opportunities to contribute to the space and make Go Wasm more efficient and more easily usable. Here are a couple of things I think um, need to be developed before Go Wasm is something that any Go engineer feels ready to use. First of all, the best practices for writing Go Wasm are still relatively unknown. I don't know if I'm supposed to call JavaScript from Go or if I'm supposed to expose Go to JavaScript. Um, it'd be nice to have something like the Rust uh, Wasm Bindgen book. This is a book that provides best practices for Rust Wasm. Um, and to have that in Go would help clarify how exactly we should be using Go in WebAssembly. Next, the memory usage in Go Wasm tends to be quite inefficient at the moment. Um, as of Go 1.12, I'm pretty sure it still asks for a gig of memory by default, which is massive to imagine asking your browser for, or massive to run in a worker. 
Uh, there's been some work towards cutting that required um, memory down to 16 megabytes, as well as implementing garbage collection so we can continue using a small slice of heat memory to run our GoWasm. Instead of asking for a huge amount of it, that never is garbage collected. Um, there are some branches of Go that already accomplish this. Devin Mullins at Google worked on a really cool one that I've adapted for my own uses. Um, so I'm happy to share that with you if you'd like to check it out. And finally, since entire runtimes are loaded into Go Wasm binaries, that doesn't mean that Go Wasm binaries are only slow to start up, but, um, or relatively slow to start up, still much faster than containers, which is great. It also means that our Go Wasm binaries are really big. That could be a bit of a burden if you're downloading that over the internet. And it also just makes for large uploads to services like workers or Fastly Lucid. I hope this talk encouraged you to think about using Go uh, beyond just servers, but also to put it in your browsers, as well as try it on some of the new serverless platforms we're seeing. I also encourage you to think about contributing to Go Wasm on Go uh, in the Golang repository, because this is something that's still under active development, and I think is a really exciting place for folks to get involved with contributing to the Go language. And finally, I hope you're excited to play with GoWasm, and I'd love to see what you build with it. Thank you so much.